All right, many issues uh, are facing California and Californians. Uh, many of them are related, affordable housing and homelessness. Let's start with affordable housing. What is your plan to make sure people have a place to live within a reasonable commute of a job? Well, the big issue is obviously not enough supply. We've been building 80,000 to 100,000 uh, homes or apartments a year, and the demand has probably more like been 150,000 uh, a year. So we need to build a lot more. But we need to build them in an affordable way, Pam. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't have the regulation that we do. Uh, we can streamline things a, a good amount. Uh, I've called for the re uh, replacement and reform of uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is now being used by lawyers to, you know, create a huge cost. Uh, the litigation is is also driving up the cost and uh, the delays uh, of building. Uh, I think it requires leadership because. We want to make sure there's still local input, but we don't want it to be a top-down thing from the state uh, uh, in Sacramento. So I, I'm, I'm going to inject a lot of leadership. I'm in the housing industry, so I know what I'm talking about. What about any time there's a development for developers, for builders, for condos, homes, even businesses, that in that permitting process you require a certain percentage of affordable housing? Well, there's there's too many layers of approval. and and sometimes those requirements drive up the cost for everybody else. So we've got to make sure that we cut the costs, we streamline the process. I've talked to a lot of builders here, and of course I, I build other places uh, in the country, and the cost to build here is just so much more. I think we can do a much better job with bringing down costs. Uh, my opponent, his answer is housing bonds and handing out subsidies to a few people. And, and that may only temporarily help a few people. It's not going to broadly increase the housing stock and, and result in prices coming down. How do we bring the cost down? Less regulation, streamlined regulation, streamlined approval processes, and, and the litigation. That's, that's the only way to do it. All right, it's not just, uh, there, how about teachers, police, firefighters? Some cities are trying to mitigate that themselves. There are police departments across the state, they are shorthanded because they don't have officers who can afford to live in the city where they serve. Same with teachers. Well, how do we fix a that? A lot of them are moving out. Uh, a lot of them are going to Texas or Nevada where they can buy twice the house for half the money, and you can't blame them. And, and again, that's all part of the housing crunch. It's also part of the just general unaffordability of California. Uh, when, you, when gasoline is four dollars a gallon and it's 250 in Nevada or Arizona, people look at all those things. And of course, that cost of gasoline is in the price of a restaurant meal. It's in the price of a dozen eggs. A dozen eggs is something like 350 uh, a dozen in San Francisco. It's two dollars and ten cents in Phoenix. I mean, how can you have such big differences? Uh, it's the cost of the uh, building that they're doing. It's the cost of the gasoline and delivering the products to the stores. Uh, it all works its way into the cost of living, and people in this state just can't make it anymore. Now, you have to admit, we are not 110 degrees. I mean, there are things. No, there, there are, are some benefits. great Why you're in California. I right? love There's some living great things here. about California. <laughs> I love living in California, absolutely. The environment, the climate, there are things that make it but it doesn't have to be as crazy ex expensive as it is, Pam. We can have clean air, we can have clean water, we can have high building standards without the litigation, without it taking 15 years to get approvals. Uh, the attitude has to change. It's a leadership thing. And I'm a businessman. I've spent a career getting results and getting things done and moving the process along. Uh, I think there's a little attitudinal issue that has to change in, in Sacramento to, to, to get some results. Are right, you a business person? How do we keep businesses from moving out? Regulation. It's taxes too, but it's also regulation because regulation is like a tax. When you're filling out forms and you're dealing with multiple bureaucracies, you're not making your product. You're not devoting time to your customers. You're devoting time to a bureaucracy. And it's that kind of regulation that's really killing the business climate. It's ridiculous that this state, this beautiful golden state, continually is at the bottom of every business uh, index. And I, I think we can change that. Okay, let's move on. Tent cities. 
there are many people who can't afford a place to live, sure. but many more who are dealing with substance abuse, yep. mental health issues. This, How do we address this? This is a tragedy, and you know, my opponent spent a billion and a half dollars in San Francisco in his term as, as mayor, and the number of homeless went up. Uh, we have got to be compassionate with people, but I don't think it's compassionate to let people live on the street. Uh, we've got to get them help. We've got to treat mental illness. We've got to treat substance abuse. Giving people clean needles and a secure room to shoot up in sounds compassionate, but it's continuing the process. Washing off the streets is a good thing. You can't walk in San Francisco, but they'll get dirty again uh, if you don't solve the problem. Solve the problem. Let's dedicate some resources to mental health, dedicate resources to getting people off of drugs and alcohol so they can live productive lives. These are illnesses. Now the other big thing obviously is building affordable housing, which is certainly something I'm in the housing industry. I'm certainly going to devote myself to that as well. Yeah, how do we, how do we pay for all of this, though? Where do the resources come uh, from to get these people into homes? We've got a lot of waste. Uh, let me tell you, uh, California spends twice what Texas does to build a mile of road. There's a lot of waste. We're spending three times what Nevada spends on each of our prisoners in our prisons. Last year, California spent $6 billion in overtime for its state employees. There's a lot of things that could be tightened up in this budget that, that need to be tightened up. And I think they need someone, you know, I've spent a career uh, as a CPA, as a businessman, uh, honing budgets, making sure we meet budgets, making sure we get the results, but live within our means. That attitude has to be done in state government, and that's what I'm dedicated to. Okay, we do a number of stories. There are people out there who are kind of choosing to live in these communities. They, they like it. They, we've interviewed them. You mean the live on the street? So the tent cities, the little oh. cities that are set up. Now, under a freeway pass, a, a overpass, it's, it's a health concern. It's a fire danger. But there are people choosing to kind of live in this sort of community, maybe bucking the system. I mean, is there a, well, a way know. we can... Campgrounds, people living in RVs. Is there any solution that I don't you see think for that? That's, I don't think that's appropriate. I mean, I, I, you've already seen it hit tourism in San Francisco. We're already losing conventions that are coming here. And people that live in a tent aren't going to have running water or a bathroom facility. And that's, you can see they're defecating and urinating in the streets. I mean, this can't go on. I mean, How do you clear them out and keep them from coming back? You got to get them cured and get them productive and get them back into society. Handing them clean needles and encouraging this behavior isn't going to get the job done. If you're, you know, you, we talked about your children. If they were strung out on drugs, would you give them a clean needle? You'd get them help, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd make sure that they got help. That's, that's true compassionate because you love your children. You're not going to settle for anything less than getting your children cured. Well, I don't think we can let any of these people continue to live in this fashion. I don't think it's humane. What have you done in San Diego that's working? Well, we're, 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 we're literally forcing people to get into shelters and getting the programs where they get cured. There's one in Carlsbad. You know, and I talked about Carlsbad, wonderful place, but there's a group called the uh, Solutions for Change. It's a public-private partnership where people have residency, but they have a timetable, and they have to get cured. And they are getting cured. They've got a tremendous success rate in doing that. I think these can be done all over the state, and we need to do it. And you know what? We'll save money in the long run because we'll establish our place in tourism again. We'll make this a, a, a much nicer place to live, and I think that's going to improve the overall economy. All right, water. Let's talk about water. Oh, big issue. You have some very strong opinions about water in California. I don't what know. are we doing right? What Pam, are we doing wrong? Do you, do you like to take a bath on occasion? My wife does. <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't have time usually, but she loves it. <laughs> you know, the uh, state legislature, people don't know this very much, but uh, they, they enacted a, a water rationing bill in, at the end of May. I don't know if you know that. You're going to be limited to 50 gallons a day in a few years. I mean, we've dealt with drought here for a number of, course of years. Of course we have. Of course right. we have. The point is, we have tons of rain and snow melt in the northern part of the state. I'm in San Diego, which is a coastal desert. 
so obviously we've got to get water there because it doesn't rain all the time. That's one of the reasons we, we like it. <laughs> uh, so we've got to balance these things. We've got to make sure we protect fish, but we also have to make sure that we have water for our own use and farmers. It's an all of the above. Build storage, absolutely build storage. Make sure we maintain the storage. Uh, it's uh, outrageous that we are, were allowed the Oroville Dam to get so badly maintained, and that's on the political class that allowed that to happen, and we're now paying for it. It's going to be over a billion dollars to fix that Oroville Dam. So we've got to maintain and build reservoirs. We've got to build recycling. And yes, we can do re desalination. Uh, it, there's a plant in Carlsbad that took too long to build, too much litigation, but we can do it less expensively. We can also do it with coexisting in the environment, not hurt the environment. I don't want to hurt the oceans. And at the same time, provide water. Israel has done it. They turned a desert into an agricultural you know, producer. And I believe we can do that as well. Since we're talking about the oceans, I want to jump in a, in terms of offshore drilling. I'm opposed. Okay. I think a lot of people want to hear your stance a absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Our, our shoreline is a huge part of our allure and our tourism. And we've got plenty of other places to drill, by the way. The Central Valley, there's tons of natural gas and oil if we, if we can get it, you know, out of the ground. As governor, you'd fight against that? I would fight against offshore drilling for sure. Okay, high speed rail. You've the train to nowhere. So you don't you don't do you find it completely unnecessary? It's or obsolete. Is it it's it's thirty year old technology. I'll, I'll talk to Elon Musk and we'll build a, a tunnel underneath the five. You know, it, it should have been done the five along the five anyway. The five has all the overpasses and it has all the rights of way. It won't wouldn't have an environmental issue. Where they're building it now, they've got to build all the overpasses, they've got to get all the environmental permits and everything, and it's going from Merced to Bakersfield. I'm sorry, those are wonderful areas, but there's not many people going in between there. I'm sorry. Uh, I think we should be building it where it's economically viable and where we can build it in a way that's not going to be obsolete. Uh, I've heard of the Hyperloop, which is this vacuum tunnel you know, a thousand miles an hour or something like this to get from San Francisco to Los Angeles. How about that in 20 minutes? Wouldn't that be interesting? Would that get used? Right now, they're up to, I think, almost three hours this high-speed rail would take. I mean, it's a boondoggle of all boondoggles. So you would be in favor of something Sacramento, San Francisco to Los Angeles to San Diego, more of a thoroughfare. I think I think there's open places. Open to ideas. There there are there are places where mass transit certainly would be huge. How about Los Angeles to Las Vegas? I have a friend of mine who's a, uh, a flight attendant on the airlines that go there. There's never an empty seat going from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. So a high-speed rail between there, a tunnel, all the way through there. You could probably do that in 20 minutes or something like that. Just imagine that. I mean, it would just be incredible in terms of opening up opportunities. But let's do it intelligently. Okay. The DMV. You've called for the director to step down. House cleaning needs to be done. What uh, did you mean by a that? A huge example of incompetence. I, I've made this a big chunk of my campaign, Pam, because it just... Is so wonderfully illustrates how mismanaged this government is. And let me tell you, it's in the schools, it's in the, you know, Caltrans, it's in the business climate, it's everywhere. But the, the DMV really impacts everybody because we all have to get this new uh, real ID, this driver's license. And I've been visiting these and talking to people who are waiting four, five, six, eight hours. A TV producer at one of the stations down in, you know, San Diego told me he, he was at one for eight hours hours and still didn't get it done had to come back the next day and why we don't know because they refuse an audit they, they won't even show us the books they won't even tell us where they're spending their money and we're using this is with an appointment did the person have an yeah, appointment the, the, the and still had, had to appointment wait. had still had to wait now some people don't have to wait with an appointment it, it's it's uneven but it shouldn't happen at all Pam I mean they've had 10 years to plan for this. I mean, this went back to 2005 when this, when this edict came down from the federal government. So they've known about this for a long time. Other states have been handling this very well, even states big, you know, uh, big enough like, like Texas. Well, 
we're using 30-year-old computer systems. Don't you find that a little bit funny that California, the home of the personal computer and the technology revolution has a, uh, a DMV that's using 30-year-old uh, equipment? Uh, I, you know, it's a sad commentary on the fact that we just need better management. And as a businessman, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that we get the management we deserve. You've been highly criticized for one of the comments that you made while in the DMV, comparing the lines to the Holocaust. Do you regret that? You know, I misspoke at a press conference outside. You know, I met a guy who was from Latvia, 90 years old, who had waited 40 years, Pam, or, excuse me, four hours. He had waited four hours in line, 90 years old. And he described to me how he was waiting in line in, before the war in Latvia. And then he had been in a concentration camp, and then he had survived the war and got you know, freed and, and came to America. And he said waiting in line at the DMV was worse than what it was in, in pre-war Latvia. Now, I didn't give all those details. You know, I just said there was a guy who survived the Holocaust or survived concentration camps, and he compared waiting in line at the DMV to wait in You can line. understand how upsetting this was, though, Well, the of course, and I would never have said that. And, you know, this is the trouble with politics today. You know, you, you make a statement, and people immediately jump to conclusions. It would be stupid and ridiculous for me to compare waiting in line at the DMV to, to surviving that horrible occurrence. Who would you vote for for senator? We have an important race for senator, Feinstein de Leon. That's a tough choice for a Republican. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, Dianne Feinstein was for a border wall and, and immigration security at one point in time, and, you know, for, for people coming to this country legally instead of illegally. Uh, so, I, 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 no question that I probably, uh, I'll either abstain or I'll probably vote for Senator Feinstein just because she's far more realistic and, and rational than, uh, than Mr. DeLeon, unfortunately. You'd like to have a few debates. I should. With we, Gavin we, the voters, The voters of this state deserve to have an airing of the issues. I understand why Mr. Newsom doesn't want to debate. I mean, he wants to talk about the president. He wants to talk about social issues, which I don't have any interest in changing. I am talking about the quality of life, the affordability of this state, the housing crisis, the water shortage, the roads that are full of potholes and, and are crowded, uh, the fires that are threatening people. And he's been in politics 16 years, and we've barely heard a peep out of him on any of these issues, and he doesn't have any real solutions for them. So, of course, he doesn't want to debate. But I think the people of this state deserve to have these issues aired and deserve to have people talking about what we're going to do about them. As you mentioned, you're not a longtime politician. You're no, a businessman. Why, a do, businessman. why do you want to be governor? Well, uh, I, I joke that my wife told me to stop yelling at the television and go do something. Uh, you know, listen, Pam, I could be doing a lot of things in my life. I've done a lot of charitable endeavors as well. Uh, and the number of people that I can help, if I can truly make a difference in this government, think about this for a second. We're spending a hundred, almost a hundred billion dollars on education, and we're now 45th or 46th in the nation. Three million of our six million students aren't reading to grade level. If I can get into office and make a difference in our education and improve those numbers, that would have a far greater impact than billions of dollars given to charity. I want to foster charter schools and increase the choices and the options of parents. My opponent wants to limit the options. He sold himself to the special interests and the and the teachers unions and the other groups that, that basically fund Sacramento. I want to get real solutions and solve the problems of this state. And, and that's why I'm running for governor. And, and uh, I'm committed to making this state a whole lot better than it is. And your opponent's criticism would be that you haven't been in politics long enough and you're not born and raised in California. You came from Chicago and you're coming from maybe not as much of an experience. What would you say? Well, you know, th we've had a lot of people that have moved to California from other places around the, uh, around the country. Jerry Brown actually uh, is the only governor in the last 50 years who was actually born in California. 
So I think uh, I'm in good company with a lot of people who came here for the California dream. And I love this state. Uh, I have a 13-year-old daughter that's been raised here, and I want her to live in a, uh, an economically viable state. I don't see that happening under the current political class. Uh, I don't see that happening with Mr. Newsom. Uh, he's going to be the status quo. I'm going to represent positive change, help is truly on the way for beleaguered Californians who are trying to make a go of it in this state. And, and that's my message. And, and I think that's why I'm resonating in the polls right now. Uh, I'm, I'm only five points down in the last poll. And that's with people starting, only starting to pay attention to this race. What do you think is the biggest misconception about you? Well, that I'm some wealthy businessman. You know, I started at the bottom. I struggled. I had a, a single mom. Uh, my real father left when I was a baby. Uh, I had to pay for my own uh, education. I had to struggle through a business and build it year after year, working real hard to, to make a go of it. I, I've had that American dream. Um, my opponent, Mr. Newsom, has had a charmed life. Uh, he was basically raised by a billionaire, uh, Mr. Getty, uh, and was funded, bankrolled by Mr. Getty and a lot of the billionaires in San Francisco. Uh, He's not had to worry about, uh, you know, getting capital for his businesses. I've had to worry about those things, and I think that's a that's something that gives me uh, more of a, a a way of identifying with the way that people have had to live in the state. We've had other top officers here in the state and the country who started out not so meagerly, who uh, provide what they say is is a good uh, background for running our country or running our state. So how is it, how does it compare starting with nothing and starting with an advantage, but still well, making, it, making the best of it? It's because I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to worry about how I'm going to feed my family or how I'm going to pay the mortgage. I mean, it, it, my, my success wasn't overnight. It's, it's happened over 40 years. So in the first 10, 15, 20 years, I had to really, really struggle. Uh, and you know, listen. Uh, my opponent talks about the inequality in this estate. Well, you know what? All these regulations and all these government roadblocks contribute to that inequality. I want to make sure that every Californian has the same opportunities that I have had. I don't see that happening right now. I don't see that happening with the status quo and the political class and, and Mr. Newsom. I'm dedicated to making sure that opportunities exist for everybody in this state. And to do that, we need to make sure we have water. We make, have to cut regulations, cut the tax burden, the gas tax, a regressive tax that's hurting the middle class. These are the substantial things that I'm talking about and that I've put my time and money behind. I don't just talk about them. I've actually lived them and done them. And that's what I intend to do as the governor. Anything you'd like to add? No, I just hope people pay attention. Uh, this is a status quo versus change. This is a turning point for California. There's an article today in, the, in, a, in a paper down in the Southern California that talks about a whole generation of Californians leaving this beautiful state. Well, I don't want to leave. People have been making that decision to leave, and businesses have been leaving. I want people to stay here. I want to see a California that grows and is uh, sustainable and viable for the future, and that's why I'm running for governor.